body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined by my producer, Joel. And today we have a very different type of story for you. I didn't really know how to categorize this particular story that we're going to be covering, but it is nevertheless very disturbing and it really brings to light some of the issues that used to go on with circuses back in the day. Today we're going to be covering the very disturbing story of the albino Ecuadorian cannibals Echo and Ico. When I first read about these guys, the first thing that came to my mind was American Horror Story Freak Show because the sort of the premise and plot of that show really kind of fits in line with not only what really happened, especially back in the day with circuses where they would recruit people they deemed freaks in order to make money off of them. But obviously in Freak Show, it gets a lot darker and more gory than that. But in this particular case, it's very interesting to see sort of how this played out in real life and some of the really fucked up shit that circuses did in order to make money off individuals they coined freaks. So that's what we're going to be diving into today. But before we get into things, I wanted to first talk about the merch drop. It is ready to go and I'm going to unveil the designs right now. What you're seeing is going to be the Halloween collection that we're going to be releasing on October 29th. We've got some absolutely cool designs here. I worked with a good friend of mine named Ramey who designed all of these for us. He did an absolutely amazing job with not only the new Lights Out logo, but all of the other designs as well. So I will say this, I am only doing a very limited quantity of these items. So if you want something, then you better be ready when October 29th comes around and jump on the item that you want because I have a very strange feeling that this is going to be one of those drops that sells out. I'm super happy with how everything turned out and all the items will be available immediately ready to ship on October 29th at milehiremerch.com and you'll see the lights out shop there. Also, if you're looking for a way to sort of chill out, maybe take the edge off at work, my CBD is some of the best around at higherlevelwellness.com. We've got a wide range of different products for you, all made from Colorado grown hemp. Really, really good stuff. We've got tropical gummies. We've got a bunch of different uh, CBD oil tinctures. We also have CBD dabs and we've got vapes maybe making their way back to the store here very soon. So if you haven't checked out higherlevelwellness.com yet, there's tons more information about CBD on there. A lot of the medicinal benefits that it has and you can save 10% off on your order with code lights out. But this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by simply save hello fresh and stamps.com. But let's go ahead and jump into this absolutely wild story of Echo and Ico. In 1899, James Candy Shelton caught wind of a gold mine in Franklin County, Virginia. It was not the kind of gold mine with TNT, pickaxes, and little nuggets of shining gold. It was the kind people wanted to see for a cheap thrill, so they could point and stare at something different. He needed a new sideshow for the Ringling Brothers Circus, and Candy heard somewhere in the tobacco fields of rural Virginia, two unique-looking brothers worked day in and day out. These boys were his gold mine, and it wasn't for their work ethic at such a young age. It was because they looked unique in a time when people paid to see anything outside of the norm. Candy Shelton was a quote-unquote freak hunter. He searched the depths of the world to find people who are considered on the fringe, Knowing people's disgust and awe towards anything remotely different from themselves, he knew they would pay top dollar to get a chance to see them. The rural folks of America rarely saw anything outside of their cornfields in the early 1900s, and almost anything was labeled a freak since they were often sheltered, and their lack of entertainment made them desperate for anything different. Candy was looking for something fresh for the circus show, he had already thrown black people in cages, given them loincloths, and made them bite the heads off of chickens. He labeled them savages from the depths of the jungle, and people would gasp in their seats. He already had a pair of conjoined twins from Thailand and a pair of dwarf brothers from Ohio that he fed raw meat. Bearded ladies were far too ordinary, and Candy knew he needed to dig a bit deeper to find his next gold mine. He put ads in the local newspapers and magazines in hopes of finding anything of interest. And sometimes when he caught wind of something special, he went out and hunted for himself. 
in a little town just outside of Roanoke. Whispers of strange-looking brothers had spread around town. Their names were George and Willie Muse. They were young boys who worked the tobacco fields day in and day out, and they stood out to the locals because they were albino African Americans. Albinism is a congenital disorder and is common among people of African descent. One in 10,000 are born with the condition, and one of the most common mutations is the disabled enzymes used to make skin pigmentation and hair color. So the boys' skin colors were extremely light. Their hair was white, and their eyes were blue. It can also cause extreme sensitivity to light as well as poor eyesight, which the brothers also suffered from. In the sweltering heat of late summer in Virginia, the tobacco picking season was in full swing, and the brothers tried making a little money for their family by working the fields as hard as they could from sunup to sundown. With their fair and sensitive skin, they covered their entire bodies with clothing to protect themselves from the sun. They would work the fields under intense heat, as others would watch in confusion. They didn't understand why they wore so much clothing in the late summer heat, but as they approached the boys, they quickly saw how different they were. They weren't like the other African Americans in town. And within the rural fields of Virginia, they weren't like anything they had ever seen. After work, they would head home, where their single mother Harriet raised them. And although their father came around every so often, he was absent for much of their lives. He was known as a local good-for-nothing, and often spent all the money he had. George and Willie were the grandsons of slaves, and their families hadn't fared much better since the emancipation. Systematic racism in Virginia had kept many black families in abject poverty long after the freedom of the slaves. Many of them were desperate for work and would toil the farmlands for terrible pay. Many of these were the same lands their enslaved ancestors had worked decades before, and even the prospect of working in a traveling circus sounded better than picking tobacco. In 1899, Candy Shelton eventually hunted down George and Willie Muse. He stared in awe at the sight of them knowing how much he could make from their appearances. They stood on the side of the road in their baggy clothes, but they made sure that they were underneath the shade of the trees in order to stay out of the sun. How different they were with their white skin and their piercing blue eyes. Candy could see them a mile away. This was Candy's gold mine. He needed them for the circus act, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. As the story goes, in Franklin County, when George was six years old and Willie was nine, Candy Shelton lured the boys with candy when they were out running through the fields of bugs and sticks. Once they approached him, he sold them the life of living among the circus with charismatic charm. They could travel, see the world, and make a living for themselves. And even better, they wouldn't have to stand in the sun all day. Anything was better than working the fields and Candy promised they could return home whenever they wanted. He said their mother had already approved the move, and that their life in the circus would be so much better than what they had had in Franklin County. Upon hearing the news, stars filled their eyes, and they quickly agreed to escape the farmland. Little did the two brothers know that they would abandon their work on the farm in hopes of living a better life than their ancestors had. But in turn, they would quickly become subject to the life of modern slaves. As soon as the brothers decided to go with Candy Shelton, the first thing that he did was rename them. He ended up naming them Eco and Ico. And as soon as they were on board the circus production team, Candy went to work imagining all the different ways to exploit the boys' rare features. They were nothing more than his sideshow projects. And when they cried to go home, he told them that they had no home and that their mother was dead. The circus was their new home and Candy was their new father. Ridiculous, they thought at first, but over the months and months of Candy brainwashing them into thinking their mother was dead and that the circus was all they had, they began believing it. They were now Eco and Ico. George and Willie Muse were the names of their past. Candy also billed them as the sheep-headed cannibals from Ecuador, even though they had never eaten human meat and were born and raised in Virginia. The audience didn't care. They wanted the thrill of seeing someone so different from themselves. They wanted to reinforce their own prejudice against anything that wasn't white or Protestant America. Candy also called them ministers from Dahomey or Barnum's original monkey men. 
He even claimed they were Darwin's missing link between humans and apes. And other times he gave them the backstory that they crawled from the wreckage of a downed spaceship that had crash landed in the Mojave Desert and gave them the name the Ambassadors from Mars. His circus sideshow of freaks wouldn't be as profitable if he named them tobacco farmers of Franklin County, so he tried to give them the most outlandish backgrounds at the expense of how they looked. And regardless of how Candy branded the boys, he always made them look as strange and as interesting as possible to the audience. He made George and Willie grow out their light hair and form them into wild dreadlocks. Their hair burst from their scalps in all directions, and Candy knew that white people would stare in awe at such a spectacle. It wasn't uncommon in the early 1900s to exploit the depictions of black Americans in the circus ring, especially in the Jim Crow South of Roanoke, Virginia. Some worked as janitors and cooks for the circus staff, literally working for pennies on the dollar. Others were locked in cages and depicted as savages. The circus promoters would coerce some of them into acting like violent beasts and often got them to eat raw meat. Some chewed off the heads of chickens or snakes in front of a shocked white audience. Although the circus promoters exploited the Muse brothers just like everyone else, they were a bit different. They added their own flair to the sideshow. They dressed in fancy clothing where their dreadlocks poured down to their fresh suits, and they added a look of elegance to their display. They even picked up music as part of their act. George often played the guitar and Willie played the mandolin. While they were still branded as strange aliens, outcasts, cannibals, and savages, they at least upheld an interesting look, rather than a repulsive one. Their sideshow became so famous that the audience members paid to get a picture with the brothers, and they would tug at their hair to see if it was real or not. In order to take a picture with them, they would pay the equivalence of $30 in today's money. Unfortunately, for the first 13 years of their work at the circus, George and Willie didn't see a dime of this money. Any profits went straight to the pockets of Candy Shelton and his associates. Despite the boys' dreams of escaping the cruel reality of their ancestors, the Muse brothers found themselves as modern slaves. Much like their ancestors, they were stripped of their family and their names. They were told that their mother was dead, and their names were now Iko and Iko. And although they were fed, clothed, and given shelter, they never received any money from the circus. Rather than gaining independence from their work, they were entirely dependent on the circus. They slept in filthy lodgings, and Candy forced them to perform their acts several times a day. Alongside all of this, Candy also banned any form of education for the boys. The only thing they could work towards was their music and their appearance. The Muse brothers didn't know any better since they were so young, uneducated, and brainwashed by Candy Shelton. To them, escape was meaningless, and Candy had convinced them that the circus truly was their new home. They also had no idea that their mother, Harriet, was actually still searching for them. She had moved to the city of Roanoke to work as a maid in the meantime, but the trials and tribulations of a single black woman in the Jim Crow South made it almost impossible for her to locate her sons. She had little resources, and the rampant racism throughout Virginia was a massive blockade in the search for her boys. Segregation was at an all-time high, and lynchings were frequent. And even though slavery had been abolished dozens of years before, white Southerners continued to see emancipation as a crime. If their mother had it bad, then the Muse brothers had it equally terrible. They hardly stood a chance with their rare looks, and their branding of Ecuadorian cannibals, and their enslavement to the circus. And alongside their growing popularity, the fire of eugenics had ignited across America. The state of Virginia had already been familiar with eugenics, and some say it was even at the forefront of the movement in the early 1900s. In an attempt to cleanse the gene pool, the state of Virginia adopted a sterilization law in the 1920s and ended up legally sterilizing around 8,000 people for various reasons, hoping that whatever condition they suffered from wouldn't be passed on. This included mental illness, deformities, and even homelessness. This form of eugenics may have inspired the sterilization movement in Nazi Germany years later. So as the audience members looked at the Muse brothers in disgust, they saw how different they were. They knew their albinism was an inherited disorder. So who's to say that the state wasn't on the verge of sterilizing people just like them? In Virginia, at the height of Jim Crow, the Muse brothers and their mother experienced the direct effects of racism, to say the least. 
And in 1926, a year before the Brothers Circus Act returned to their home state, the Ku Klux Klan held a rally in D.C., not far from their home. The white supremacist leaders declared that they wanted to keep the states under the control of white native Protestants. So on that note, the Muse brothers' return to their home was certainly not a warm welcome. And I wanted to point out, before we continue, that there's a lot of speculation about how they really got involved with the circus. There's one version where Candy Shelton convinced them to come and promised them all these things, but it seems to me like he basically just kidnapped them and stole them away from their family and their mother, whether it was consensual or not. It seems like he literally kidnapped them from their own mother. Especially since he was saying that their mother was dead and the whole brainwashing. Yeah. You know, that to me makes it seems like they were kidnapped. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's really fucked up what he did to them and taking them at such a young age away from their mother and then their poor mother who had no idea where they were and was searching all over for them. And little did she know that they were in this horrible, horrible circus. And it's absolutely terrible how Candy just manipulated them, like gave them all these false promises. And once they were in his custady, it was just the complete opposite. Takes full advantage of them. That's crazy. Yeah. But with that being said, we're going to take a quick ad break and then we'll continue with the story of Ico and Eco. There's big news from my favorite home security company. Simply Safe just launched their new wireless outdoor security camera. That's right, Simply Safe, the system that US News and World Report names best home security system of 2021, just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the advanced tech and security features you want to keep you and your family safe. This camera has an ultra wide 140 degrees field of view so you can keep watch over your entire yard it has 1080p HD resolution with an 8x zoom, which means that you can zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates in order to capture critical evidence. It also has a built-in spotlight with color night vision, so you can keep an eye on what's going on day and night. It's super simple to set up and usually just takes a few minutes. This camera is amazing because you can literally put it anywhere on your property as long as it's got a Wi-Fi connection, and with a rechargeable battery means you don't have to plug it in anywhere. This is great for homes that have larger properties, such as myself, I have almost two acres, so being able to see a lot more of that now is really, really convenient. So to learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, just visit simplysafe.com slash lights out. What's more is Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash lights out. I've got a lot going on from week to week. I mean, I run two companies, I record three podcasts. So the last thing I have time for is grocery shopping, let alone cooking and cleaning up. So that's where meal kits like HelloFresh come in absolutely clutch pretty much every day of the week. If it wasn't for HelloFresh, I like to joke that I probably wouldn't eat at all because, or I'd be eating absolute trash and paying way too much for it. But what's great about HelloFresh is that I get to go online, I get to pick from a wide variety of different types of meals and recipes that change from week to week. And they include vegetarian, calorie smart, gourmet options, which are some of my favorite. So there's tons of variety. Then the ingredients travel from the farm right to my door within a week. So I get all of that convenience without skimping out on the quality. I gotta say, I don't think I've ever gotten a bad box of ingredients or produce or meats from HelloFresh ever. It's honestly better than the stuff that I even see or have gotten at the grocery store in the past. Best of all, HelloFresh is over 30% cheaper than grocery stores. With those pre-portioned ingredients, you know you're only going to cook what you need and there's not going to be all this excess food or wasted money on food you won't end up eating. So go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut14 and use code LightsOut14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut14 and use code LightsOut14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping today. And our last sponsor for today is Stamps.com. Since 1998, Stamps.com has been an indispensable tool for nearly 1 million businesses. I love Stamps.com, my business higher level wellness. We use it for all of our USPS and UPS postage. Stamps.com has made my life far easier because I'm able to print postage right in my warehouse, and then I can schedule USPS to come pick up our packages on a daily basis. But best of all, they save me tons and tons of money on my postage. Because of Stamps.com, you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from both USPS and UPS. All you need is a computer and a standard printer, no special supplies or equipment, 
And within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, and anywhere you want to send. So save time and money with stamps.com. There's no risk. And with my promo code lights out, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in lights out. That's stamps.com, promo code lights out, because with stamps.com, you'll never go to the post office again. In October 1927, fall had finally reached Roanoke, Virginia. The leaves were changing and Halloween was just around the corner. The locals thought what better way to celebrate the season than watching a caged man eat live animals, stare at men with elephantitis, or gawk at a set of Siamese twins. Despite the circus industry beginning to see a decline in the 1920s, the freak sideshow business remained a vital cornerstone of entertainment. And the Ringling Brothers Circus was the biggest of them all. Not even approaching the Great Depression would stop them. The 1600 circus employees crowded into the city and unpacked their travel bags. They set up four locomotives, 100 rail cars, five rings, six stages, elephants, camels, lions, and a high wire act. Soon the rural folks from the area would gather, and they waited anxiously for the circus to come to town with nothing else to do besides pick tobacco and kick rocks. It was often their only form of entertainment in the otherwise dry life of rural Virginia. By this time, George and Willie Muse had spent almost 13 years as Eco and Ico, and their former life of working in the fields was just a distant memory. By this point, they were very certain that their mother had died, and that the circus was their home, and Shelton was their father, despite how much they hated him. After they set up their usual show, tuned their instruments, and rehearsed a bit backstage, they poked their heads out for some people watching. Folks from all over had come to see the circus, young and old, rural and urban. They had also specifically come to see Eco and Ico, as word had gotten around about the excellent musical performance they put on. It was rare to see a freak show and a good performance. Usually it was one or the other. So the brothers' gig had become a must-see show at the Ringling Brothers Circus, and as they looked out at the crowds passing by, they recognized an old neighborhood friend, Leslie Craft Crawford. They barely remembered her, but she certainly remembered them from their prominent features. After a quick hello and goodbye, the brothers began to wonder who else they would come across at the circus since they were so close to their old home in Franklin County. Around the corner, they looked at the big sign advertising their show. It read, Are they ambassadors from Mars? The brothers headed back behind the curtain until it was their turn to perform. When the curtain eventually drew, a packed audience greeted the brothers with small gasps and whispers. And when Iko and Iko began playing their tunes, the crowd cheered in wonder. They played It's a Long Way to Tipperary, an old British song used to march in World War I. And it was strange that the supposed ambassadors from Mars knew such songs and spoke English, but the crowd didn't care. As they were a minute into the song, a woman elbowed her way through the crowd and made her way to the edge of the stage. As George looked at the strange woman who had clawed her way forward, he recognized her almost immediately. He stopped playing his guitar and stopped Willie from playing his mandolin. And while still looking at the woman, he said, There's our dear mother. Look, Willie, she is not dead. And Willie also noticed the bright face of his mother. Tears streamed down her face. Both of the brothers set down their instruments and jumped from the stage. And in bittersweet reunion, they embraced their mother for the first time in 13 years. As they cut their set short, the audience cleared from the area, and the reunited family headed backstage to celebrate their reunion. They wondered how their mother had found them. Not only was attending the circus as a black woman rare, if not against the law, Finding them under the banner of ambassadors from Mars was even more of a long shot. She told them that she had a dream the night before, and it told her to go and visit the circus. She didn't know why, but she just trusted her gut. As the family embraced in joy, tears streamed down their faces. But before they even had a chance to catch up, Candy Shelton barged into the room. His face was red with anger, and when Harriet tried to explain she was their long-lost mother, he dismissed her. He told her that he was their father now. Nothing was going to get in the way of one of Candy's most lucrative sideshows. Harriet, 
Understanding her status in the oppressive system of the South knew that she wasn't going to win the battle there in the circus tent, so she prepared to win the war. When the police showed up at the circus, Harriet gave a harrowing explanation of how these brothers were her long-lost sons and that they had been trafficked and held against their will for 13 long years. Surprisingly, she convinced the local authorities that what she said was true. From her work as a maid, she even scraped together enough money to afford an attorney. Harriet wasn't going to end her fight after convincing the local police, and as retribution for all of her son's years of enslavement, she was planning to go crazy on James Candy Shelton. After their reunion, Harriet began legal proceedings against the Ringling Brothers and Candy Shelton. Her attorney argued that the circus had held the Muse brothers against their will and used them as slaves. But there was one kink in the legal proceedings. As the defense searched for the decade-old records, they found evidence of Harriet contacting a circus operator by the name of Stokes with interest in putting her sons in the circus. Even though the story of Candy luring and kidnapping the boys had been the more well-known story, no one knows for sure what happened. Regardless, no one had consented to Candy Shelton taking the Muse brothers, or forcing them to perform, as well as denying them wages for 13 years. Maybe Harriet had only wanted a better life for her sons, rather than picking tobacco and living in abject poverty for the rest of their lives. In the end, the Muse family won their court case, and the circus agreed to pay back all of the wages for their 13 years of work, and to sweeten the deal, James Candy Shelton's employment from the circus was terminated. When the Muse family thought it couldn't get any better, the circus also offered the brothers a formal job, with increased wages agreeing to pay additional wages to their mother, and they even promised to hire their other brother, Tom, for various work around the circus. And with their mother's blessing, they agreed. The Muse brothers rejoined the circus in 1928 and traveled all across the world. While their unique looks still sold the show, they put their music abilities first and foremost. They even played at Madison Square Garden, and some say they performed for her royalty at Buckingham Palace. Yet for the culture of London, no one was interested in their show, and they scoffed at its exploitation. But the brothers were finally happy to just be playing their music. The pay was also the best that they had ever seen. It was better than their ancestors had ever dreamed of. Even throughout the Great Depression, the Muse brothers made a successful living. The additional wages sent to Harriet allowed her to buy a house of her own, and the Muse family quickly rose out of poverty. The only one who didn't have the best of luck was their absent father. His family often had no idea where he was or what he was up to, and he squandered much of his own money. And one night, he was murdered by a rage-filled husband who had found him in bed with his wife. Aside from this tragedy, though, the Muse family was on the up and up. Harriet continued her legal efforts throughout the years, and she made sure the circus continued to pay her sons, and that they verified where they were at any given time across the world. Knowing her sons were safe and well paid, Harriet lived a comfortable life in her farmhouse for the rest of her days, and she passed away peacefully in 1942 with a clear conscience and a bit of money to her name. She had saved a considerable amount over the years, stowing away a bit of money any time the wages from her sons came through. With this inheritance, along with the sale of her house, the Muse brothers were able to afford a tract of land and a place of their own in Roanoke. The brothers continued their act as Ico and Ico for many more years. They learned new songs and practiced their guitar and mandolin as they toured the world. They grew more and more resilient against the glares and gasps of their audience. Because they knew they looked different, and they owned it. With Candy Shelton gone and a load of cash to their name, they had somehow carved out a decent life for themselves after all the years of exploitation and abuse. After decades of performing, they quietly retired from the show business in 1961. They were ready to settle down in the Roanoke home and live a comfortable life. Wealthy and wise to the intricacies of show business, they told their tale, which would later become a critical narrative in the history of black Americans who lived in the Jim Crow South. Their journey from poverty through slavery, exploitation, and eventually a bit of wealth stands as a harrowing journey through the racist trials of American history. Even their feat of owning a home stood as an iconic turning point. Because owning a home as a black American in the 1960s was incredibly rare. Only 38% of black households owned their homes compared to 63% of white households. 
At their property in Roanoke, they spent their twilight years with family and friends. Both of the brothers' eyesights failed, and they went blind, which is common for albinos. Their sister Annabelle and her daughter Dot ran the household for the most part, and as the brothers sat in their rocking chairs, they played their music. George Muse eventually passed in 1972, and although Willie hadn't taken the death of his brother well, he went on to live for several more decades. He straightened the pictures of his mother in the living room hallway even though he was almost entirely blind. He could still see her face in his memories. Their time together, although relatively short, he recalled fondly. And of course his brother, although he was gone, he lived on through the music he would continue to play. And by the end of the 20th century, American culture began shifting against circus entertainment. They saw the exploitation of people and animals as tasteless. Although the Ringling Brothers Circus would continue throughout the century and shut down permanently in 2017. Following a massive lawsuit regarding their use of elephants, the circus died along with its outdated forms of entertainment. And most states had already banned the exploitation of people with deformities. The freak show cornerstone of the circus life, the slave labor and the abuse of animals, couldn't last. Willie Muse went on to outlive every single person who took advantage of him and his brother, especially James Candy Shelton. In his heart of gold, he regarded Candy as the only man he ever hated. Twisted and vile, Candy was the kind of man never to be trusted, exploiting and enslaving others for money. Dollar signs had clouded his eyes, and he was willing to do anything to make a dollar off of a cheap thrill, no matter the emotional damage he inflicted. Candy Shelton had kidnapped Willie and his brother, lied about their mother being dead, and enslaved them for 13 years. Even in his elderly years, these were the things Willie struggled to forgive. And as Willie reflected on his youthful days spent in slavery at the circus, even on his best days he referred to Shelton as scum of the earth, sometimes even referred to him as a cocksucker. But in the end, after all the torment and lies, Willie and his brother made it out with a fair share of wealth and a lovely house to spend the rest of their days, something their ancestors could only dream of. Willie Muse lived for more than a century and passed away in 2001 at the age of 108 years old. Oh, wow. Absolutely insane Yeah, that Willie lived that long. But good for him. Good for Willie Muse. Despite how hard the brothers had it, I mean, I think this is the first story we've covered in a long time with a happy ending. I know, right? Like, I'm glad it's got a happy ending. It's good to get a little bit of happiness in yeah. there every once in a while. It can get pretty dark here on Lights Out. So oh, yeah. To have a somewhat of a disturbing story, have a happy ending is a is a rare, rare sight to be seen here. That's Definitely. for sure. I don't know if it's just me, but Candy Shelton sure reminds me of the character Stanley from American Horror Story Freak Show. A talent scout that's out there looking for freak talent in order to exploit them enslave them and really just torture them for years and years and years psychologically and in american horror story physically it's honestly kind of crazy because when i i recently had watched that season of american horror story and i was just like honestly blown away it's actually my favorite season out of all the ones that i've seen because i think it really does especially after hearing this story really does draw a lot of comparisons to what actually happened to people and that in the early 1900s, these freak sideshows were a real thing. Like this was something that just was around for a very long time. But obviously things have changed quite a lot since this story took place. I mean, the early 1900s were a very, very different time. And, you know, there's still tons and tons of racism. I mean, it's pretty clear that Candy Shelton was clearly a racist. Yeah. I mean, just the things that he called the Muse Brothers is insane. Calling them sheep-headed cannibals and stuff yeah. just to try to get some tickets sold i mean it's just sick what they used to do to these poor people and they would you know lure them in at young ages in order to promise them the world and money and stuff and then just totally exploit them and totally take advantage of them i mean it, the the whole circus show is just a real sick yeah. business model to be honest i mean through and through well it seems back during that time you know the circus dominated the entertainment industry because that was it yeah. no tvs you know that yeah was basically it that was like with. the best live entertainment like as far as like traveling shows go yeah obviously in cities there was movie theaters and you can go to sporting events but if you were out in the middle of nowhere yeah you know the only entertainment that you got was what was coming through town that right, week. and right. so these circuses used to make a lot of money by 
traveling all over the the country and visiting different rural towns and drawing people in with these freak show acts. So I'm glad it doesn't exist anymore. And I'm really glad that the Muse brothers were able to escape it yeah. and ultimately get, you know, get the wages that they deserved and ultimately live the rest of their life the way that they wanted to. That's despite being, you know, most of their childhood being spent being enslaved and tormented and laughed at and yeah. gasped at by, by audiences all over the country that they actually got to, you know, have sort of a, a peaceful ending to their life. So, but what's hard with the circus is nowadays, I mean, obviously they can't abuse humans, but to me, I still feel like they're abusing animals, you know, keeping them locked up in cages, making them do whatever yeah, I mean, they that's want, like, stuff like that. Circuses are. That's, that's why I don't like going to a circus, you know, I even know back circuses in the day. are still around circus show. <laughs> I'm going to Google it real quick. Cause yeah. now I'm curious. Cause I know you and I went to a few when we were growing up. Yeah. Um, is that even around the, uh, El Jebel Shriner circus? Yeah, the Shriner. I'm pretty sure if there is circuses now that they don't have animals in it. Okay. Cause like that got shut so. down and like the Ringling yeah. brothers actually like straight up went out of business in 2017. Oh wow. So circuses are really like a thing of the past. I mean, gotcha. there's definitely not animals doing tricks anymore. Okay. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm sure there's still a circus out there or two in the world, but I think the majority of the ones here in the United States have since been shut down or they have absolutely no animal acts. It's like, clowns and like yeah you know magicians and people think acts like that right, versus right. making elephants stand on their hind legs and dance around in a ring yeah for the audience because yeah when you look really look at it it's like okay i get it's entertainment but it's also like super fucked up yeah to those involved including the animals and then when talking about freak shows it's obviously super bad for them too i mean they're just getting made fun of Oh, and man. exploited for their disabilities, which is completely fucked. Yeah, it's so fucked up. So I'm glad we're in a different age of yeah, existence now where this is not a thing anymore. Because, I mean, that's the last thing that people should be doing is paying to go make fun of or get some sort of entertainment out of somebody else's deformity or disability. Dude, like That would not fly today. No, like, no, 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 no. No, Kenny Shelton would be... <laughs> he would canceled. get jumped. Yeah, yeah, he would be canceled and maybe even killed, depending on where yeah. you are, so... What a what an interesting story. I just thought this one really piqued my attention because obviously of the American Horror Story similarities and references. And it's just rare that you find stories coming out of the 1900s mm -hmm. of what circuses and freak shows were like. You know, yeah. I use that term in reference to the time period. But I just found it really interesting that, you know, obviously the first thing that caught my attention about this was the fact that there's, you know, some articles written out there about cannibals These albino yeah. ecuadorian cannibals when in right. fact that was literally just you know it drew me into it uh -huh. and that's exactly how they used to draw just clickbait and, yep, yeah yeah they would basically clickbait the Jeez. rural farmers to come in and pay money to see these guys God. just play instruments it's not like they were doing anything that interesting i mean playing instruments is awesome but they weren't like you didn't really do anything else they're just mu musicians yeah. that happen to be albino so it's really it's really weird that you know back in the day people are so sheltered compared oh yeah to now now you can look up anything instantly on the internet. But back in the day, you yeah, were, to that yeah, it was circus like tent. what your parents told yeah, you, what your parents maybe told like what your school told you, right? your church. And other than that, like you really had no exposure to what else was happening in the world and the different types of people and all of the diversity that there is. So yeah, totally different time period. But you'll have to let us know what you think of this story. What do you think of the Muse brothers? Do you think that when Candy Shelton approached them that they willingly went with him or did he maybe he forcibly kidnapped them? I'd love to know your thoughts on this, but hopefully you enjoyed this lighter version of the Lights Out podcast. We'll be back next week with a very, very bizarre story. Yes. Another Warren Files, in fact. Very spooky. Coming your way before we round out October with some very, very brutal cases that we'll be covering here. But until next time, lights out, everybody. everybody.